Hi, I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mujica. I'm a professor of chemistry. So, Vladi, we are teaching BCH 341 in the spring semester of 2019, and we've been using Yellow Dig, which is basically um, a site where students can get peer-to-peer -peer or peer-to-instructor uh, help on stuff. I think of it as kind of like Facebook for education, where they can post stuff and either get their other peers to respond to them or have us respond to some. And we got a question, um, actually very recently, I wanna say just yesterday. Um, and so I thought I'd bring it to this discussion today and I, I think have, us having a dialogue about this may really help students when they're solving problems. And so the question was, and you can tell, so some context is they've been given a lot of homework problems and they're just covering the first and, you know, they're just covering the first law, second law, the basics of thermodynamics, right? And so it's very common, especially first law, moving to the second law, that at some point, in fact, that's why I even put this here uh, at the start, you know, you end up almost always discussing a Carnot cycle because it has so many nice features as far as helping to understand, you know, uh, important things like what is an adiabatic process? You know, what is an isothermal process? What is it about going around a cycle? Um, and how does that relate to, to something without having to get to the molecular level? How does that relate to heat entropy? You know, can you do cycles and get back, you know, without changing entropy? And, and so this has a lot to do with how we start to think fundamentally of the second law. Yeah. And uh, so, but, but we, yeah. we get to this and it's very common, right, that we, we ask a lot of very practical questions. And this it definitely is just a student asking a general question on the site. They're not regurgitating the exact homework problem, but they're just, what, what he's generally trying to get across is, you know, hey, I'm looking at a gas expansion problem in a container, you know, so, you know, we can immediately say like, you know, like, so he's taking, you know, a gas and he's expanding it, right? Like, you know, and, and you know, under a given number of moles, so for a constant mm -hmm. composition, right? So we can kind of start to write like delta N is zero, it's constant composition, two different volumes, that's kind of explicit in uh, the idea that it's a gas expansion, right? That this is going to be, you know, volume one and volume two and volume two is going to be greater than volume one. If it was the opposite, it would have been compression, um, et cetera. And then he gives a hint. He goes, but these two volumes, you know, and a temperature you need to figure out the second temperature. Right. So what he's implying there is that this is at one temperature and that this is at some other temperature. Yeah. Right now, you know, the simplest answer is oftentimes we do isothermal expansion, right? We yeah. isothermally expand. But right? probably let me let me interrupt you there before you go into that, because there is an interesting thing here. Let's say that we are going to assume ideal gas behavior. Which, well, and, and they haven't stated it here, but let's face not, it, that is here. so common that so, oftentimes that isn't stated in Yeah, in so problems. let's say we, we need this assumption, yeah. idea gas behavior. And then we know that the equation of state is PV equal to NRT. NRT. So now we see that in this equation, there are four things that we can change. We can change the pressure, we can change the volume, we can change the number of particles, we can change the temperature. So now, as you said, this is constant. The number of particles is constant. So what it means is that we can write P1, V1 divided T1 equal to P2, V2 divided T2. But the problem is that this is not going to help us. Because when, I mean, this helps you if you have one of them fixed and you can play with the other or whatever. But in, in this form, this is true, but it's not going to solve the problem. Because for this process you are describing, V1 changes into V2, T1 changes into T2, and also P1 changes into P2. So we cannot have one equation and determine right. the, the, well, the, all you know, the quantities. What you could do, though, is you could assume this is an isothermal 
you know, compression that, you know, that the second temperature is the same as the first temperature. And then you would be able, you know, right. to do a little more, right? Like, so on the, on the that assumption, you should be able to solve the problem. Yes. But this doesn't tell you this. Did you, uh, the two volumes and the temperature you need to figure out and the second temperature. So the, the safest thing here is to say, this is not isothermal. As, as stated, it's not a solvable problem. Yeah. So, and what's missing here is, you know, like you said, the explicit assumptions about the process. About the process. Yes. But what you would say is having you and I having seen this so many times, and and I like to point this out because it's not just students that often when they're rewording something or restating something, forget to, you know, put the problem in such a way where all the limitations or assumptions are stated, even. Textbooks, even professors often, they get so used to, for example, using an ideal gas that they just say a gas expands and they assume you're going to, you know, they assume you're going to figure out the, or make the assumption that it's ideal, that you have to pick an equation of state and, you know, they're going to, you know, have you make those assumptions independently. Right. Um, and then, but, but you're going to have to make a couple of assumptions here to solve it. You could make the assumption that, um, you know, it's uh, expansion and that the two temperatures are the same, it is isothermal. Or you could also, you know, more likely, because like you said, the implication is, is that you're looking for a second temperature. That right. temperature does change in this process. Right. Well, at that point, you need to have some constraint of the walls of the container and know the equation of state. And the most con common constraint is to constrain the walls to be adiabatic. Right, so that's one way to look at that. And can I, yeah, I can write here. So the other thing is that we need an extra thermodynamic equation. So let's say we need the one for the change of energy. So the change of energy is going to be C dt minus PdV. So, now, for an ideal gas, we know that the only term is Cb dt. So we know that if the temperature change, the energy has got to change. And if the temperature remains the same, the well, energy Well, for an ideal gas, ideal you know gas. that the internal energy is only dependent on temperature. Right. And its heat capacity. But it's I mean, like, capacity. it's not dependent, you know. Now, but if you made the gas more complex, if you made the equation of state more comprehensive, then you can get things where the internal energy depends on more than just the temperature. Right? Exactly, because then it would be dQ plus d omega in general, and you can get dependence here, U as a function of the volume and the temperature, which for an ideal gas, the internal energy is only a function of the temperature. So again, it goes to the fact that the way it is stated, this problem has different solutions depending right. on your assumptions. But what I like to point out here is what students shouldn't do. I mean, if, if this is what you're stuck with, you know, e even if, the, you know, what you should do is state, hey, if I make these assumptions, this is how you would solve it. If I make these other assumptions, this is how you, I mean, in other words, you can try to be as thorough as possible just by saying, given the information I have, these are what I would consider reasonable assumptions and reasonable assumptions that are needed to solve what you're asking for, which is what is the second temperature. One reasonable assumption would be that I'm doing an isothermal expansion. Hence, it would be at the same temperature. That's kind of an yeah. easy solution there because it's asking for to figure out the second temperature. It would be the same, you know, but that would be something where you would have to, um, you know, state that this is the and that it's a, it's the you know isothermal expansion of an ideal gas, for example. Right, and then. But, but but like you said, the more common one is they wouldn't ask for a second temperature if it was the same as the first, right? So right. The, the more, but then there's no way around that except to both assume a fairly simplistic equation of state where the internal energy is only dependent on temperature, and then be able to use and 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 what I like to point out. So on the, just before that, on the that assumption, then these two the be removed are the same. And, and then yeah. you know V1, you know V2, two. 
And out of this equation, you can actually, you know, the, 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 then there is the question about the, the, the pressure itself. But in principle, you can determine everything that is connected here. You need to figure out the second, second temperature. Well, if it is isothermal, the second temperature is the same as the initial yeah, yeah. temperature. So you assume that's not the case. I mean, because no. like you said, okay. it's asking you to solve something and, and that would kind of be the trivial. So then we forget about the isothermal right. but, but, assumption. You know, th but that's why I like to come back to this one. Like, you know, let's face it, when you do expansion, these are, you know, two of the most common, both practical ways we treat expansion of a gas and compression, but either under isothermal conditions where we're going to take this as an ideal gas because that's almost always what's used to state this, where this one, of course, the internal energy, you know, is, I mean, there is, uh, you know, he, you know, what I, I think a lot of people forget here, I'm always amazed that students think isothermal and they think, oh, you can't change the heat. But this one, you can. In fact, the heat is equal and opposite to the work. It's that you don't change the internal exactly. energy. Exactly. You know, here, you this is true. Adiabatic means no change in heat. But, you know, that doesn't mean that you don't have work, you know, involved uh, in the system. And so the internal energy will be directly proportional to just the work in this term. And so, and and let's face it, this is kind of what. If I was to read into the question, this is what I would be assuming, that this is the type of expansion they're looking at, that they're looking for, you know, they started at this volume here and they want to know, and they move to this volume here, they know that they're at a certain temperature and they want to figure out what their final temperature is. Exactly. And the only way to do that is to have an equation of state that you can easily look at, and it's usually an ideal one, and to assume that it's adiabatic. Um, and then if you do that, then like you said, you can make CV dt equal to, you know, minus PDV. And then we can substitute in NRT uh, over V. We'll put the V over here. We'll put the CV um, T. DT divided by T. Yeah. Uh, DT dt divided by T. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and solve, right? Like, uh, and basically then you'll get that, cause you'll get the change in volumes here. Um, and this is just in R. And so, but what you will need is you'll need to know the heat capacity for an ideal gas, uh, the heat capacity at constant volume. You will, uh, assuming that, you know, it, it's asking for you, for, you're gonna solve for T2, the second temperature, but you're gonna know the two volumes that it goes between. Right, and then you can actually integrate this equation and, and, and assume that you know the heat capacity and determine knowing V1 and T1 and V2, you should be able to determine T2. And you don't need a specific knowledge. I mean, it is implicit there, <coughs> but you don't need the specific value of pressure because right. each of these- And then you this... could even, if, if, if you were an advanced student and you wanna make even more of an impression, you can even go kind of beyond that and say, well, CV varies depending on whether it's a monatomic gas, a diatomic, a tri... So you could even say like, oh, this is actually what you would get depending on what type of ideal gas you had exactly. for common. I mean, let's face it, monatomic, by the time you get to diatomic, that covers a fair number, you know, cover a few of those and say, you know, give a few different, you know, potential temperatures. You could almost tell what type of gas it was. Yeah, so th this is a very, I mean, let's praise this student for this question, because it really, I mean, this is why we insist that this type of question should be, you know, asked or posed at the, at the yellow, yeah. yellow league. Because it gave us a way to use this question to teach something to all the students. And, and this question, even, even if we take that, that the way it is stated is confusing because the process is not stated, there is not. So again, don't give up. Say, I mean, it would really make a very strong impression if you say, okay, this equation is ill-posed, maybe, but let's say we have one assumption, we know how to work it out, isothermal process. We have a second assumption, we know how to work it out, adiabatic process. You didn't tell us what it was, but here you have your two answers. That would be very impressive. Yeah, really. exactly, exactly. I would be most impressed by a student doing that. Yeah, yeah, and, and let's face it, like, no professor, if, if, if a professor forgot to state an assumption that was kind of critical, you know, like for example, in this one, they forgot to state that 
under adiabatic condition, under adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas uh, is what you kind of would expect so that people could state the assumptions very clearly in this one. But you know, if, if for some reason a professor forgot that, but a student didn't just throw up their hands, but actually answered it saying, let me make some reasonable assumptions based on just basic knowledge of expansion of gases. And if I make these kind of basic assumptions, this is what I get. If I make some other ones, this is what I would get. I think any professor would be incredibly impressed to see somebody you know, take that on. In fact, I almost, tell every student to start working a problem because half the time what they're looking for is they're, they're just searching in the book for the one equation that fits, you know, an exact, you know, I have every variable except one, you know, I can solve. When I almost always tell them first, read the problem and start stating equations that you can, that are the limitations, that are the, the things that they're telling you are constant, that the things that, you know, when they tell you that it's adiabatic, the first thing you should start writing is Q is equal to, you know, zero. I mean, like when they start telling you some of, it's an ideal gas, you should write down an ideal gas equation yeah, of state. Right. You know, you, you have some things to go off of just based on the, you know, problems. Yeah. And I just copy here the, the correct equation for the for the adiabatic expansion. And then you see that if you move this t down here to the denominator, you can actually integrate this just using the integral dx divided by x equal to the log of x. Yeah. So then you are able to actually go from the differential expression. And both the of them will be that. Yeah. It's just the one, I think it, it'll go as the negative. One will be reversed, right? Like, because one, it, it goes as, because it, it'll be as minus PV Right, but be, that, yes, but that is in the du is equal to CVDT minus PDV. So I put this. Oh, this, so that'll be plus right, when right, it goes right. over. Yeah, right, 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 right. So, so this equal to zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So hopefully that general discussion, you know, would help any student, you well, know, when they're looking, you know, at these type I, of problems. And, and again, a, a, Congratulations to the student who asked this question. Yeah. And then what I would generally say, again, I, you know, any help would be appreciated. You know, I've been looking online, you know, my guess is if you go back and read the question, it'll say something about ideal gas, adiabatic. And if you just type in Google adiabatic expansion of an ideal gas, you're going to find tons of help. I think it's that you were, you know, um, typing in kind of what was written here, which is very ambiguous. And so, you know, search engines usually require fairly precise search. You know. Just before I, I forget, I mean, this process, adiabatic expansion, is so common in nature. That this is the main reason why the temperature in the valley of Phoenix is so very different from the temperature in Flagstaff. Because it is air adiabatically being expanded, and this explains why, as you go up a thousand meters, you roughly get 10 degrees difference in temperature. In temperature. It's exactly this process. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's something we'll be covering, you know, later on as well, like how, you know, these things, like looking at, you know, famously, you know, looking at how boiling points change with elevation and, and different things, et cetera. So we'll get to a lot of these altitude type things. It's also, you know, altitude is one of the main things used as you get to really high stratosphere to really start introducing non-equilibrium processes, how there's really a gradient across things that drive a lot of these cycles, et cetera. So anyway, um, that diverts a little bit, but I think uh, hopefully this, you know, dialogue helped uh, students a little bit in these type of problems as well. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you to the students.